sketch, a sketch uh, of, of, of how, you can, how you can derive the amplitude frequency relation for the Duffing oscillator because I will need this relation uh, for, for what, what I'm going to explain next. Now, okay, that, that's the slide we have seen in, in, the, in the very first, uh, <laughs> that my very first slide of the first lecture, uh, and that, that's a response of the, of the linear resonator, which is Lorentz and concentrated around the eigenfrequency of the oscillator, depending on uh, how you drive it, with what frequency you drive it. Now, uh, that's, that's the Duffing oscillator. And now I put it, I mean, I could have put just the, the, final, the final result. Uh, but I thought, okay, uh, Mark has derived it, spent some time. You could have got an impression that, that, that it's, it's really difficult. I, I hope you didn't, but, but you could. Uh, and this is something you actually, if you are working with something nonlinear, you come all the time against very similar questions. I mean, nothing, okay, now you have seen it, you can, you can, you can go to Mark's lectures, you can go to, to, to literature, you can find the result, but the next time, instead of nonlinearity power 3, you have also nonlinearity power 5, what do you do? And then you have nonlinear dumping, so you have dumping plus x squared, what do you do then? And then you have a parametric excitation. What do you do with the parametric excitation? I mean, there is just this, 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 uh, this framework would help you to do all those things once you need them. And, and it's actually easy. The only thing is indeed you have to be careful and you have to understand what you are doing. And, and what, what I'm now summarizing is the last half an hour of Mark's lecture. So I'm not going to show anything different. Right, so we start with this equation. First thing we do, we go to a rotating frame. So instead of this, uh, I, I'm using slightly different notations, but, but I hope it's okay. Instead of momentum, uh, instead of coordinate and velocity or coordinate and momentum, we define these new things u and v. Now we are driving the oscillator with the frequency omega. So we expect that the oscillator responds at the frequency omega or maybe close to omega. And because of that, that's exactly a rotating frame. It means that those u and v are time independent or very weakly time dependent. That's a scale separation. Right now, if we do that, we get those equations for u and v. So u dot and v dot are equal to to that. And that's exact. That's an exact transformation. I didn't do any approximations. Now, we need to do approximations because we cannot solve this exactly. And if we start looking at that, right, we see different combinations of the sines and cosines. Like we see, for instance, sine times cosine. And we know that's sine of a double uh, of, of two omega t. And we see here cosine times cosine, we know that's one half plus cosine squared over two. And we see here some crazy things from, from, from the third power. And most of those things oscillate in time. And they oscillate in time with the double frequency, with the triple frequency, with the quadruple frequency. And there are a few things which don't oscillate. Like this cosine squared, there is a component which doesn't oscillate. And then we do this. Uh, let me go to the next slide because I have it copied on the that, that the same as, as we, we have seen. Then we do the rotating uh, rotating wave approximation. So technically speaking, we average the whole thing over time. And if we average it over time, all those fast oscillations disappear, and we only have terms which oscillate very slowly or don't oscillate. Okay, and then we just look what are those few terms which don't oscillate, and then as I said, we had we had this cosine squared, which is on average one half, and we have cosine to the four, which is on average three eighths, but then we have other things like like I don't know, sine omega t cosine cube, 
from UGP, which is on average what? Zero. Good. Um, and then if we do all that, we get a much simpler equation, which still have u dot and v dot on the left hand side and something on the right hand side. But but no time, so all these cosines and sines are gone. And then I say, okay, fine. Uh, maybe in the first instance we don't care about the time evolution. Let's just take them time independent. And then we just say, okay, this is zero and this is zero. And then we have just two algebraic equations, which are third power equations in U and V. And then we can plot it, we can define the amplitude, which is, uh, which is um, square root of u squared plus v squared. And for this amplitude, we get this nice equation, which is uh, an equation with respect to r squared. That's a cubic equation with respect to r squared. And this cubic equation, Mark analyzed it yesterday, quite spending one some time. So sometimes it has one solution, and sometimes it has three solutions, uh, one real solution and three solutions, and sometimes meaning depending on the force and, and, and the frequency. Uh, and, and this, uh, he didn't have this, uh, this plot, uh, uh, but I need this, this plot in this, in this form, but, but he had something equivalent. He plotted it differently. So what is plotted here is well, essentially, the, the, the amplitude of the oscillator versus uh, the frequency. And the frequency here is normalized in such a way that one means we are exactly driving at the resonance. So that's uh, actually omega minus omega naught in my notations. And this is omega exactly equals omega naught. All right, and then what you see is that if this nonlinearity I'm sorry, this is an image from somewhere else, so it doesn't have my notations. But this, so this beta is, is my, 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 my alpha. Uh, you see that, well, first of all, depending on science, it does either on the sign of, of alpha, it either goes that way or that way. And then you have this, this kind of big shape uh, uh, of, of the response. So instead of a Lorentzian, which goes nicely like that, you have this response, which goes like this and then goes back and then goes like that. And I can also show that this part when it goes back is unstable. It's actually, well, you can show it formally, but, but it's also, uh, you can easily understand it by kind of thinking that this amplitude, I mean, every solution is a minimum of, of energy, right? It's not trivial to, to understand what this energy is, but, but every solution is some minimum, right? And if you have min a minimum here and a minimum here, that must be a maximum in between. And if you have a maximum in between, it's unstable. So if you have two stable minima, and the maximum is an unstable solution because the system can go that way or that way. And so in practice, if you drive a system by, for instance, increasing the frequency, you will have a hysteresis. So you will follow this branch and then at this point it becomes unstable and so you will just go down and follow that branch and if you drive it by decreasing the frequency you go all the way up to here then here it becomes unstable then you jump to the stable branch and go down so this hysteresis would be a kind of uh, signature of this duffing behavior okay i think that's what i that's what i need and I will now go to, 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 to this op uh, optomechanical induced transparency. And that's a slide which I already have, so I will not explain it again as much. And, 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 and also John explained it very nicely. Uh, just, just to repeat that, that we have uh, in this, uh, this, this is a setup for an experiment, for an experiment in which we drive uh, a cavity by, uh, by, 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 by a pump laser at the frequency which is uh, cavity minus mechanical. And we have a probe laser which probes uh, the uh, transparency of the cavity close to its resonance. 
And I, I, I spent some time explaining it. John spent some time explaining it. We have seen the results. We know that, that there is this optim, opt, optomechanically induced transparency peak, which develops, which is very sharp and, and, and very high. Now, that's all fine. Imagine you drive it harder and harder and harder. What, what happens? I mean, at some point, your cavity is linear, so nothing happens to the cavity. But at some point, because you drive it, you also excite the resonator. And at some point, the, the, the resonator starts moving with such a big amplitude that it becomes nonlinear. And in this case, you can basically assume that this is just not a linear resonator anymore, not a linear oscillator, that's a duffing oscillator. And you can ask what is the result of the, what is the effect of the duffing oscillator uh, on, on this optomechanical induced transparency. And the first actually had an experimental answer. That's the experiment by the group of Tobias Kippenberg. Uh, so th that's exactly what they have done. They were driving the cavity harder and harder, and they were looking. That's just a theoretical picture. So that's uh, this 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 history that I explained to you. So, uh, but but this is the experiment. They were just looking at the at the response, and what they are plotting. Uh, Remember the, the optomechanical induced transparency is when you have transmission versus, uh, versus frequency and you have a cavity resonance and on top of this cavity resonance you have this peak. And what they are plotting is actually this part. So in, 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 in their picture this is almost flat. So that part would look like like this, and eventually it would go down, but, but they don't plot that because it's not interesting. So this is the, the cavity, and this, this peak is, is optomechanical induced transparency. And you see if you increase the drive, and you increase the drive from this curve to that curve, this one is pretty much Lorentzian, as, as we should expect. And this becomes, uh, that, that show, clearly shows history, this is very similar to the theoretical curve for the Duffing oscillator. I believe they also actually could, 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 could fit it with the Duffing, uh, with the Duffing oscillator uh, formulas. Okay, so that's a very clear message, right? So, and they even have it written explicitly in the paper that uh, actually the shape of the optomechanically induced transparency peak repeats the response of the mechanical resonator. Right, and if this is the case, that would be great. Right, you can take, you can classically bring the resonator to any kind of crazy motion, and you would be able to use, to use uh, optomechanically induced transparency to basically image this motion. That that's much easier than to observe the resonator directly, because it oscillates somewhere. You need some something to to observe it directly. It's not easy. It's I mean that requires some additional things in the setup. And here you have it just easily. Okay. Now those are the DELT experiments from from Gary Steele group, which which I'm also involved. That's exactly the same thing, with the exception which I already mentioned. They have a single port cavity, so they don't have transmission. They only have reflection. So their cavity uh, is, is their, their, their optomechanically induced transparency is actually optomechanically induced reflection. And it's not, not a resonance upwards, it's a resonance downwards and the deep here. But other than that, it's, it's the same. So we could just take this one take a mirror image and, 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 and get the result. And you see what, this is what they, what they observe experimentally. And that's not, not at all a Duffing response. That's something which is clearly different. I mean, let me maybe sketch it. Duffing would be 
to that and then it goes down uh, otherwise it would just go like this so nothing would be would be that and what they see is is this which is not nothing okay now uh, that that's that's why that's why they came to us and and uh, and, 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 and we made the theory. And the theory, I could have put it here because it's actually based on input-output relations, uh, which, and, and uh, Clemens even reiterated, not probably having that in mind, but reiterated that input-output relations are very general. Whether you have a linear system, whether you have a non-linear system, whatever system you have, you can dump everything in and if you dump it in, and if you are able to solve it, you will always get the result. And that's exactly what we have done. We have just, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, input-output relations, we just put the duffing force acting on the resonator, and then we have solved it. We couldn't solve it exactly because it's nonlinear, but we could solve it in the same sense. I have just shown you how you solve the duffing oscillator. If you don't care about the total response, but you only care the response of the frequency you drive, you can you can do this. You can go to this rotating frame. You can you can average. You can go to rotating wave approximation, and that's exactly what we have done. But not on the level of the Duffin equation, but on the level of the of the of the input-output relations. That's a bit too cumbersome, so I'm not going to show it here. But we learned one thing, which kind of helped us to explain why we have this response. We learned one thing, and the, the thing is that this is uh, the response for the amplitude of the oscillator. But the oscillator doesn't just have an amplitude, it also has a phase. And the phase is also doing some non-trivial things. Like, for instance, we know, I don't have a picture here, but we know that for a linear oscillator, if you go through the resonance, the phase goes, the phase jumps by pi. And, and he does something, something even more crazy. And if you take this, uh, this, this, this phase into account, you come to, you come, you, you can theoretically reproduce those results. Uh, let's see whether I have it on the yes. This is, this is our theoretical curves. Okay, now that's great. But then, of course, we are in the situation when we have two experiments which explicitly contradict to each other, right? We have that by Tobias Kippenberg, and we have that by Gary Steele. And, and Weber Singh has the first, the first author to measure that. And then what you do? Well, you start looking whether the experiments are actually done, have been done under the same conditions. Well, I mean, they will not have done under the same conditions because I, I, didn't, I didn't mention that, but this is an optical cavity, and this is a microwave cavity. But still, well, I mean, it's still a matter of parameters. So, I mean, if you, if you have a correct expression, you have different frequencies, whatever. I mean, that, that's fine. That, that's, that's, that should not be a reason why the results are different. If you do everything properly, and, and, and if you, 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 should, you should get to the correct results. Now it turns out that the difference is actually this coupling parameter. Remember, I spent some time on my last lecture, and uh, I think other, in other, you have seen it also in other lectures. So there, is, there, is, uh, uh, there are losses, and there are losses in the cavity, and there are losses in the external circuit which in this case is a waveguard. And you have this parameter, I believe I had, I call it the C last time, never mind, which, 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 is, which is this ratio, which is always between 0 and 1. Uh, that's, that's, that's called coupling. It's not the same as optomechanical coupling. It's a coupling to the external circuit. It's something else. That has, that has nothing to do with optomechanical coupling. Uh, and if, if this is exactly equal one half, it's called, uh, it's called uh, optimally coupled. If it's below one half, it's 
uh, undercoupled, and if it's above one half, it's overcoupled. I mentioned that last time, but now I'm repeating it. And uh, the the delta cavity is overcoupled. So the Munich cavity was undercoupled. And then we have actually repeated our theory also for undercoupled cavities, because in the theory, I mean, what, 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 what we do, we just do all the calculations, and then in the end, we go to the experimentalists and take the, the, the parameters they used and try to fit. Uh, and, and of course, we were using the, 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 the delta parameters. Now, we have, we have also repeated the calculation. I have taken the, the, uh, the uh, Munich parameters, and that's what we get. That's the theoretical results. Uh, let's look only on the left panel. So, uh, if you have a, an overcoupled cavity, that's, those are the pictures for, for, different, for different drive, and that reproduce the, the, the uh, I, no, I, I, I lost it, so, oh, yeah. that reproduce this one. So, that's the delta experiment. Now, theoretically, that they haven't seen it in the experiment, but theoretically, if you drive harder, at some point it flips, so instead of being, uh, in this case, optomechanically induced reflection, it becomes optomechanically induced absorption, and then it becomes duck in shape. And if you, uh, if you uh, start from an over, uh, undercoupled cavity, it's from the very beginning duck in shape. And that's the Munich results. And then we have also done, that, that, that has not been done experimentally, but, but we have also done the calculation for the case you drive it at the blue side bend. And we see that the opposite. So for an overcoupled cavity, it would be from the very beginning duckin shaped and, 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 and slanted on the, right, on the left. For the undercoupled, it would be first this funny shape like that. And if you drive it harder, it flips and becomes duckin. So it's just Total opposite, uh, total opposite to the to the overcoupled. Okay, now why I'm talking about that, right? It looks like some 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 minor detail, you know, coupling to an external circuit. Why why the hell should anybody ever care about coupling to an external circuit, even if it flips the shape? Well, because there is some physics here, and the physics is nice. And let me explain the physics. Uh, Uh, now let's plot first before any 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 optomechanical induced transparency. Let me plot the minimum transmission or minimum reflection as a function of this parameter. Again, the plot is taken from somewhere, so this this kappa internal is is what I call here uh, what I call here here kappa. Never mind. Uh, and this 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 minimum transmission or minimum reflection depends on this kappa and it becomes zero when uh, the two uh, uh, two losses are the same when this kappa external equals to kappa internal i think for experimentalists it's probably easy because that's impedance matching for theorists i don't have a very good argument, but for instance, you can think about about a transmission through a fabri perot cavity, and in a fabri perot cavity, if both transmissions of both mirrors are the same, you get the maximum, you get one. So something always happens if you have these two elements. Something always happens if the elements are the same. And that's kind of the same thing. I mean, I can formally derive it. I don't have a good hand-waving explanation why why it should go to zero, but but it definitely has a minimum. And, 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 and but just just you can derive it. You can try to argue it, but that that's a fact. Now remember, I I showed this formula last time, and actually Clemens uh, was talking a lot about that, and then derived it. Uh, <laughs> Now, the, 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 the line width of the cavity, which are the losses in the cavity, is renormalized by the optomechanical coupling. 
and that goes to plus and minus and I think plus is for uh, red detune drive and minus is for, uh, for blue detune drive and this correction is related to cooperativity and remember last time I, I used that expression saying okay now we have to compare this uh, this um, this correction to kappa itself and if uh, if 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 this becomes too big then um, and, and this means cooperativity becomes one because it it's exactly equal to kappa when the cooperativity is one uh, so if uh, if cooperativity is one then as the blue detuned drive we get kappa which is zero renormalized kappa which is zero and that's instability and, and Clement spent actually quite some time explaining what do you have in this instability regime and, and, and what happens now okay so if we change change this kappa then it means that for the uh, our system for the red detune drive always moves to the right and the harder we drive the further it moves to the right now if you write it at the, at the blue detune it moves to the left now under coupled cavities uh, sorry i'm probably screwing up things I would need to check. I, I could have used uh, that. That actually, uh, it's probably uh, probably external losses. I, I I would need to check. But anyway, so the corrections of errors is correct. So if we are undercoupled, we should be here. And then if we are undercoupled and and and, and red detuned, we are only moving that side, and nothing happens. I, I mean, quantitatively we change things, but qualitatively we don't change anything. Now. If we are undercoupled and blue uh, detuned, then we are moving that side. And here horrible things happen. So we first pass through the zero. We go on the other side. So here the slope is different. Physics is different. And that's where we actually switch from that shape to that shape. And then if you drive even harder, which, which, which not has been shown in that experiment, but, but we know it should happen, uh, then we heat up the instability and then we have amplification now if you start and that's exactly what what our theory uh, gives and, and that's also why uh, why for an undercoupled cavity in the Munich experiment they, they only see one shape and this is nothing change now if you start from overcoupled if you blue detuned and drive it then it just goes at some point to amplification but nothing happens in between but if you read the red detune drive, it goes first down, goes here. So here we shift, we, we switch from one shape to another one and flip the flip the the uh, flip the uh, the peak, and, and then it goes here. And and that explains why actually those two have very different physics, and and, and that results in this case and in, in all these strange shapes. Good. Okay, if you got lost, now you get a second chance, because now I will be talking about uh, nonlinear cavities. And as I mentioned, an optical cavity, we just, I think, safely say it's, it's very difficult to make nonlinear. So I will be talking specifically about microwave cavities, and I mentioned last time uh, that microwave cavities are typically superconducting. Uh, for some of you know very well what superconductivity is, but for others it's just a buzzword. So I will spend a little bit of time explaining what superconductivity is and what the Josephson effect is. If you know that, just skip the next three slides. If you don't know, listen, that, that would be helpful. I will not explain all things. That, that's both, mostly the textbook material. Uh, I, I will... I will put on slides more than I want to explain, and slides will be online uh, in, in an hour, so you can, you, can, you can check it as a first reference, and if you need to know more, you really need to, to go to solid-state courses and read. So that, that's very very brief crash course in, in superconductivity and Josephson effect. Now, superconductivity is, is a state of matter different from, from a metal. So if you take a metal, some metals at very low temperature lose electric resistance. And they really lose electric resistance. It not just becomes so 
small that you cannot measure it, it really becomes zero. And, and that's a phase transition into a superconducting state. So this state at, at zero temperature or very low temperatures is superconducting. And, and temperatures are really low. I mean, for, for aluminum, it would be 1.2 Kelvin, I think. Uh, and for niobium, it would be 9 Kelvin. And, and those are, I think, for molybdenum rhenium, those are materials you typically work with in, in, in this business. That would be like, I don't know, also like about 10 Kelvin. There are superconductors which have much higher, much higher transition temperatures, but they are not interested, interesting from the point of view of, of those applications. Uh, now, uh, that has been very well understood. It, there have been Nobel Prize given out, Nobel prizes given out. I will not go into details. What is important are two things: that first of all, a mechanism of the superconductivity is that in a superconductor you don't have free electrons. And electrons are bound in pairs. They're called Cooper pairs. And, and each pair contains two electrons. And so the charge of a pair is double electron charge. And another one is that I said, so that's a new kind of state. That's a coherent state. Not coherent state in the sense of, of that, or, or not immediately. But, but that's a macroscopic state where you have the whole thing is, is coherent. And because it's coherent, it's, it is described by a single phase. Uh, so you can introduce something which is, which is uh, called an order parameter, or you can also call it a gap. And, 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 and what, what is important for me is that this, this order parameter or gap has a phase, phi. So if you have a piece of superconductor, this phase is, is very well defined. It also has an amplitude, which tells you how close the system is at the transition, and the transition it disappears, and then in the normal metal, this gap is zero. OK, that I said, it's a crash course in, in superconductivity. Now let's go to a Josephson junction. A Josephson junction is if you have two superconductors which are put next to each other, and they are separated by some barrier, mm -hmm. in the simplest case, by an insulating, insulated barrier. Technically, you basically take a piece of aluminum and you oxidize it, and then you put another piece of aluminum, and that's your junction. Now, those two superconductors could have different phases. And I call them here minus phi over 2 and phi over 2. So what we, were, we are going to be operating is the phase difference, that one minus that one, and that would be phi. Now... Uh, um, that, that was an insight of Josephson, for which he got a Nobel Prize, and, and that's called Josephson effect, is that actually if those phases are different, then there is a current going through the junction. And this current is going through the junction in the absence of any voltage, so that dissipa uh, dissipationless current. So you have current, but you don't have ohmic losses which is maybe not so much surprising because also in superconductor, right, you could have currents, but you don't have ohmic losses because you don't have resistance. But here you do have resistance in the interface, but still you could have current without losses. And now you can ask, okay, what, what this current should be, how it should depend on the phase. Uh, and, and your first idea is that in any case, it should be periodic. Because if you rotate a phase by 2 pi, nothing changes. And so in any case, whatever you do, this, this current must be a periodic function of the phase. Uh, now, uh, what, uh, what, what it exactly is uh, depends a little bit. But for that, you can convince yourself that the, the, you, can, you can write the energy of this junction, and the energy would be cosine of the phase difference. And the energy has a minimum at phi equals zero, if I've written it like that. And that means the junction wants to be at zero phase difference, and that's an equilibrium. And if you take it out of equilibrium by putting different phases, it wants to go back to equilibrium, and then you will have current flowing through the junction. 
And now I didn't mention you can you come to that expression by saying, okay, maybe we have that's a bit hand waving. I mean, you can do it much more precisely, for which I have no time. Uh, but but you can say, well, you have Cooper pairs, and maybe a Cooper pair can just go. Maybe you can have a Cooper pair which penetrates from one superconductor to another superconductor. And, and, and then if you, if you start reasoning in this way, then, then you come to the conclusion that that should be the overlap of those Cooper pairs, and the overlap would be proportional to the cosine. Now I, I will show you what the current is on the next slide, but, but there is one more important thing which I need. I need this relation. So, and this relation tells you that actually those phases are related to voltage. And remember, I just said that if if we have if we have uh, if we have uh, different phases, then the junction goes out of equilibrium, and then we then then we have current. But voltage is all also a way of putting the junction out of equilibrium. And then this shows, and there is this gauge argument which I will not go through. Uh, that, that gauge invariance argument, which uh, tells you that actually the time derivative of this phase is proportional to voltage. So those two things, putting phase difference and putting voltage across the junction, are almost the same. And this is called the Josephson relation. Uh, you can also say, okay, let's just take junction and apply it voltage. Normally, if you have a normal junction, that would mean, well, there is a current which is proportional to the voltage. But here it's not current, you will just rotate the phase difference. Current is already there, but you will be just rotating the phase difference. Right. Now, uh, once you have the energy which is phase dependent, you can, you can, you can also use this, this, this gauge, gauge, gauge invariance argument, and you can you can derive the current, which in this case would be proportional to the sine of the phase. And that's it. So we have this junction, we have, uh, we have, uh, uh, we, 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 we have the phase, current is proportional to the phase, so I see the constant which is related to the properties of the junction. It's actually proportional to the uh, transparency of the junction, absolute value squared. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the phase, uh, if, if the phase is time dependent, you also generate voltage. Now, okay, that's the simplest picture you have. Now you can start adding more design. Um, now I, I, I don't have it on my slides and I don't have too much time, but let me still try to spend a little, a, a little bit of time, because I think that's important that you have seen it once. Uh, now, what we have derived is just basically a socket element, right? So that the new socket element, Josephson junction, and we know that that this current is just proportional to the sign of the phase. Now, in practice, you have other stuff going on. For instance, one thing, you also have electrical resistance. You cannot easily add it to the Hamiltonian, as we know, but, but it is there. You also have some charge accumulation. And this charge accumulation is described by a capacitor. There is somewhere some capacitance around. And what people commonly do, they use the mod, so-called model of resistively. Uh, I will write it first, okay. Resistively. Resistively and capacitively. Shunted junction. And uh, which is abbreviates as uh, CSG, resistively capacitively shunted junction. Sometimes in the literature you see just RSJ, whatever. That, that's all, all about the same thing. People do say, okay, let's, let's just forget about physics. Let's stupidly describe it as a socket element. 
Okay, so we have uh, wall junction, not just three things in parallel. Because they all happen at the same time, so they should be in parallel. You have this Josephson junction proper. You have resistance. And you have capacitance. A and let's see what the junction is doing. And let's, let's put some current. And the current must generate some phase. Let's see what, what phase does it generate. So the current equals, first of all, because that's a socket, it equals to the sum of the three. So it equals to uh, Josephson current. I will, uh, uh, I, I, will, I will explain in a moment what, what I mean. The current through the resistor and the current through the capacitor. Right? So uh, Josephson current, we know it's just IC times sine J, sine pi, sorry. We have capacitance, uh, resistance, that would be just voltage, whatever it means, divided by the resistance. And we have capacitance, which is C V dot, uh, C V dot, right? And we know that V, is proportional, the coefficient is over there, is proportional to phi dot. So in fact, this term is phi dot, and this term is phi double dot, with some coefficients which I can derive if I take that into account. Okay, that actually means a lot of things. So we have that equation, right? So we have phi double dot times something, plus phi dot times something, equals to I sine phi minus this current. Uh, now, basically, we are, well, some of us are theorists, and one of the kind of main uh, part of the job description, you should be able, if you see an equation, you have in some new uh, in, in, some, in some setting which is new for you, you should be able to figure out what does it look like. Do you know any other systems which are described by the same equation? Okay, and we do know. For instance, let's, uh, just to make it kind of more familiar, let's write an equation where this phi would be x, right? It would be x double dot times something, x dot times something, and, and, and some function, which I will call f of x, which in this case, well, that equals zero, and this f is uh, this i sine phi minus i. Right, and if you look at that equation, I mean that you would probably be all able to recognize it, right? That's an equation of motion for a particle. That's a mass term, that's a friction term, and that's the force which acts on the particle, which is the derivative of the potential energy. And what the energy would it be to give this force? The force is I C sine phi minus I. Uh, that's uh, the potential would be I C indeed cosine phi with the minus because it's... Uh, no, okay, let's write it like that. Uh, minus uh, I phi. Right, this gives me constant, and this gives me sine. And I, I should write this force as minus d over dx, d, d, dx, so that that should be minus, which, okay? Um, And now if I plot it, right, how it looks like depends on, on, on the relation between I and IC. Right? Because I have in the energy, I have IC and I, external current and the Josephson current. And if I is less than IC, I have that. And if I is bigger than IC, uh, uh, 
I have something like that. Right? And that means what, what does now 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 we understand what the particle is doing, right? He is just moving down. It goes to the minimum of the potential, potential doesn't have minimum, just going down. Here it's sitting here and oscillates maybe in a in, in a minimum, but to go here it should really go through that maximum. Now, what does it mean? Okay, that's phi. That means that in this case, phi dot, which is voltage, is not zero. So the system generates finite voltage. And here, maybe at any moment voltage is not zero, but if we average it out, it's zero. So there is no voltage in this case, in this case, and voltage in this case. If you want to generate voltage here, you need to go through the maximum. And that's not easy. I mean, you need to supply energy to the system, for instance, at finite temperature or whatever, but, but it's, that, that becomes, becomes complicated. And another thing is uh, that actually what it is doing in the maximum, in the minimum, is determined by the mass term. So this capacitance has a role of a mass of a particle. Uh, and you can actually, if you, uh, if you write the energy, you, 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 you choose all, all, all correct, all, all, you add all correct coefficients, and you see that you have an energy of the Josephson junction, which is proportional to phi dot squared with this coefficient, which is proportional to the capacitance. And this is like a mass term. That's like inertia term. All right, now I, uh, okay, I have to speed up a little bit. So uh, now one thing which is important is that, remember I mentioned that, that we, will, we will be talking about inductive coupling, and we will in a couple of slides. But let me first show that if, if we have this expression, we can actually easily derive the inductance of the Josephson junction. Right, because I just tried those two equations. That's nonlinear, so that's not useful. If you want to define inductance, we need to go to the linear regime. Linear regime meaning we replace, for the time being, sine with phi. So we have this current. We take the derivative of this expression. And on the left, I have i dot. On the right, I have phi dot, which I convert into voltage. And we get a relation between i dot and voltage. And we should, uh, I have it on, on, on my slides. Uh, so the general relation is that I dot is inductance times voltage. And we just read out inductance. And our inductance is just that. So the, the Josephson junction has an inductance. That's useful because, because we are going to use it. Now that's a squid. That's a system of two Josephson junctions, we just make a loop. And let's, for simplicity, take two identical Josephson junctions. You can also do it if they're different, but, but for simplicity, I'll keep them identical. Now, uh, that's called DC squid, actually. Squid is uh, for superconducting quantum interference device. There is also something else which is called RF squid, and that's a different thing. I, I'm not going to talk about that. So for me, squid is DC squid. Now, let's just take these two junctions and see what would be the total current through the squid, so from here to here. And that's obviously the current through the left branch and through the right branch. So we just write it like that. Now, what are those phases? Uh, OK, one thing which we know for sure that if we walk around, then we get some phases in the superconductors. And here are some phases in the superconductors. And also, if you put magnetic field through the squid, magnetic flux, we should also get phase which originates from this flux. And we know that the total, flux, the total phase increment should be zero or maybe two pi times an integer, because we should come to the same physical state of the system. Let's say it's zero, so it's irrelevant whether it's uh, which integer we take. And now, if we just calculate everything, so this, if we go through the junction, we get a phase difference. 
if you go through that junction this way, we get minus phi 2 because we are going in the opposite direction. And magnetic, the total magnetic phase we get would be actually equal to, to 2 pi uh, uh, time, uh, magnetic flux divided by phi naught. And this phi naught, I've already had it on my first lecture. Uh, this phi naught is a combination of fundamental constants. And that's different from this phi naught which I had on the first lecture by a factor of 2 here. Because here, E now is not a charge of an electron. It's a charge of, so sorry, this E is a charge of an electron. But what we should have in the flux quantum is a charge of the Cooper pair, which is doubled. And that's why this superconducting flux quantum is twice as small as the normal flux quantum. OK, now if you plug it in, that's the, the expression which we get for the current. So uh, this phi is phi 1 plus phi 2 over 2. I should have had it on the slide. So it acts like a Josephson junction. So also it's proportional to the sign of the space times some amplitude. And, uh, and, uh, and, and this, this amplitude is 2 times the critical current of a junction times uh, cosine of this pi times phi divided by phi naught. And that's actually why those squids were originally developed for precise measurements of magnetic field. Because you can measure magnetic flux with the precision of phi naught, which is a very small number. But flux is field times area. So if you take a very big loop, the only thing you have to care about is that the whole thing is coherent. You don't lose coherence when you go around the loop. If you can make it meter by meter and it would be still coherent, it's still fine. And then you get a very precise measurement of magnetic field. And that's why it was designed. It's actually used, it's still used for that. I mean, it's, there are the scanning squids. You can, you, can, you can measure magnetic fields locally very precisely, whatever. Okay, now we are ready for inductive coupling because now we have everything. So imagine I have this squid loop and I have flux. And the flux is not perpendicular to the area, but has a little bit of an angle. And I have part of this loop which is mechanically compliant, so it can oscillate. And if it oscillates, it actually changes the area which the magnetic field sees to form the flux. So the flux would be dependent on the position of this mechanical part. And then if it's dependent on the position of the mechanical flux, but, sorry, I have inductance, which is, remember, it's proportional to the critical current, and now it's proportional to this phi, which depends on x. And this is inductive coupling. So if I change uh, the position of the resonator, I, 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 I change the coupling, and, uh, and, 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 and then just, yeah. So it couple, I change the flux and it couples to the it couples to the to the to the curve. That that's that's an idea which was proposed in those two papers by John Misel and by Egal Books and Miles Benkow. Miles will be next next week here. Uh, that's an experiment which which shows that that that's from Delft, from the group of Harry Van der Zand. That's that's actually the squid loop. Here maybe if you have sharp eyes, you see a Josephson junction. Here is another one, so this, 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 this white line. The whole thing is suspended. I mean, they started with something a bit less fancy, and, and, and that was the most advanced device they had. Uh, and, uh, and this is, well, actually, that, that's on a different device, but the same idea, different paper. Uh, what, what they did, they could drive the resonator mechanically, so piezo, they had a piezo substrate. And they could drive it with some frequency, and then they measured the voltage across the squid. And then they see in the voltage they have a peak, and the peak is a function of frequency, uh, and, and then identified the position of the peak with the frequency of the resonator, which is 2 megahertz and perfectly makes sense. Uh, and also they could get a quality factor, which was in that case 18,000, and that's also they could also measure the phase, which is doing exactly what the phase of a driven resonator should be doing. Um, now I probably, let me skip that. that, that's nice stuff, but I would spend more time explaining that. And I, I have like three minutes, let, let me give you a little bit of perspective. 
I mean, all these things I showed you for the squid or things I didn't show you for the squid, they are all DC. Well, they're not DC, we have seen it's 2 megahertz, but a typical frequency of a squid, well, squid is, is now our cavity. It's some fancy cavity, but it's a cavity. We can operate it in a linear regime. And we know that the frequency of the squid would be in the gigahertz range. So the mechanical resonator is much, much slower than the squid. And we operate our cavity very far from the cavity resonance. So we operate it with the frequency of the mechanical resonator. And, and you see things I used, I mean, why, why I had to why I had to, to spend 20 minutes and use the whole boat is because that's not actually optomechanics. It's completely different physics. It's, it's very nice physics, maybe even nicer than optomechanics, but, but it's not optomechanics. Now, uh, let's see what happens if we add Josephson junctions to the cavity for simplicity, if we just take a squid, whatever. What can we expect? Nobody ever, as far as I know, measured that at the frequencies of the cavity. So that, that this, this nonlinear optomechanics in terms of the cavity with Josephson junction just, just experimentally doesn't exist. Let's, in the last couple of slides, let's try to understand what we can expect. And I only have time for very simple things. I don't even have time for simple things, but let, let, let me do it. So let's first of all quantize. So we know what the energy is, we know how we quantize it. Right, and one thing is uh, we have this, this Hamiltonian for the cavity, which is usual Hamiltonian, but we also add this, uh, this, this, this Josephson energy. And the Josephson energy is difficult to quantize, we can do it, but, but let's expand it and let's treat it at the level of the of the Duffing oscillator and quantize, and Mark mentioned that what we get is called, in quantum mechanics, Kerr Hamiltonian. So this Kerr Hamiltonian is that, that basically we know that A dagger A is number of, number of photons, so that's essentially number of photons squared up to some commutation relations. So we know everything about the cavity. Now interaction, you cannot quantize. Because interaction, you have cosine, and if you start expanding things, it doesn't work. So you, can, you cannot quantize it generally. But you can quantize it in two limiting cases. You can quantize it for the case we just treated, so when the cavity is very slow. And then what you get is a beam splitter interaction. And you get the nonlinear term, which is we call cross care interaction. So that's number of photons times number of phonons. Uh, number of phonons. Now, the funny things here is, first of all, beam splitter, you usually get by linearizing radiation pressure. Here it's not. You just get it properly from, from the Hamiltonian. Another thing, it actually disappears if your squid is symmetric, if the two junctions are the same. So you have to, to, to do something more complicated. You have to take different junctions. And that's actually part of the reasons why this physics I explained to you is different from cavities. It's something else. I mean, it's not a cavity. Now, if you go to the cavity frequencies, you can also quantize it. And then you properly get radiation pressure with the constant coupling, which, which, which uh, depends on the parameters of the squid. And actually, by, by all theoretical calculations, you can go to very strong coupling. And again, you have this cross care, which is the simplest nonlinear interaction. So at this regime, it should operate as a nonlinear cavity. You will have nonlinear interaction, and you have here in the nonlinearity of the cavity. And actually, all those parameters are, if you are thinking about the flux cavity, the, the squid cavity, all those parameters should be tunable by the magnetic flux, which is additionally good. Uh, okay, I have one slide. I apologize again for my drawing uh, that that I had to do yesterday night and and. Okay, uh, so that what we sh should we expect if we just drive the cavity, right? I mean, in the first instance, okay, if the cavity is linear, we just get a Lorentzian. Now, this is a non-linear cavity. We should get something which uh, responds as a Duffing oscillator, which is supposed this thing in the middle. 
So that, that part is unstable, and this is, this is kind of what, what we get. Now, we know that we should also get mechanical subbands in a linear oscillator if it's coupled to a mechanical resonator. How do the mechanical subbands look like? Naively, you could say, okay, maybe each of them is also a ducking response. No, nothing like that. Because ducking response is only in the limited range of frequencies. If you go very far here, it's not ducking. It's a tail from, from, from the Lorentzian peak. But it's the same. Like if you go very far from the resonance, you cannot say whether it's Lorentzian or whether it's ducking. And those things, well, I mean, if you have a good cavity, if it's very well resolved, those, those things are sitting at the tails, and then they should be Lorentzian. And maybe then if you increase the drive, maybe that, that, that one would actually merge with those side bands, and then you will have something completely different, and that would be different physics, which, which I, I don't know anything about. And the last thing, uh, and that's really my last two slides, and I will not go through the details of the slides because I have no time. There was an absolutely brilliant paper, 1986, by Jörg and Stoller. You know, 1986, that was way before any, well, I mean, that was already, optomechanics already existed, but, but people were not thinking about, about quantum state transfer, and they were not thinking about quantum state transfer, they were thinking about something completely different. They were thinking about some nonlinear medium and propagation of waves and, and what happens, well, I mean, that was at Bell Labs and, you know, they're interested in whatever, cables and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so, doesn't matter. The problem they solved is they have taken that Hamiltonian, so that's, uh, uh, that, that's, a, that's a usual cavity. There is no mechanical resonator, only, only, only cavity and they didn't even call it cavity, and that generalized care. So you have this power p, which is an integer, and for p equal 2, it would be care. And now you can say, okay, fine, let's start with the coherent state, and let's see what the state is doing as a result of evolution with this Hamiltonian. And you can solve it exactly. And this is the result. So this function is a function of time. The only thing that changes you have here, the phase, which is i, k, number of photons, which is in the Fock state, to the power p times time. And p is integer, and that means that this function is periodic. So if you take t, uh, time and time plus 2 pi over k, that's the same. So 2 pi over k is a period of the oscillations of that. And now if you look what happens after a quarter of a period, you just take this time, which is pi over 2k, you get a cat state. So you get this combination, which, well, you get, you get something which you can rewrite as that. So you have a coherent state with alpha, another coherent state with minus alpha, with some phase factors, and, and this plus. So it means, uh, that, sorry, that's specifically for even uh, P, so that that's already, already for, for, uh, for, for, that's already for care. If it's odd P, there is something else. So it means if you have a Kerr interaction in a cavity, you just take a cavity, wait for a quarter of a period, and instead of a swap, you create a Kerr state. And that should be doable with the Josephson junction. And that has not been done. And then you just take the same cavity and transfer it to a mechanical resonant, which is conceptually kind of easier than first preparing a cavity in a in a, in, a, in, a, in a crazy state, and then, then trying to transfer this crazy state. That's, as I said, so that's my last slide. I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. As I reiterate that none of this last part has been ever experimentally done. Maybe one of you will do it at some point. That, 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 that's something which, which, which I believe would be kind of expanding. And... Right? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, but not transferred, no, no, sure, but not transferred to the mechanical resonator. Oh, no. Sorry, I, I probably didn't, 
didn't formulate it correctly. I actually mentioned that in the very beginning, but yes, sorry. I don't know, this is kind of weird. Well, actually, the, the simpler question first. That differential equation for phi, mm -hmm. that looks just like a damped pendulum, right? It is. OK. So I know that's a hard differential equation to solve, but since we've been thinking about damped pendulums for a long time, we kind of know everything we need to know about these. Uh, yeah, that, that equation has been solved. OK. In you can. With psi phi in it? Yeah. Okay. So you can, uh, first of all, let me switch it off. Uh, because then it becomes first order, uh, and uh, you can basically. Uh, I even wanted to solve it here, but I didn't have time. Uh, that, that's all known. Uh, then, if it's underdone, you can solve it, but then it becomes tricky. Then, then there are some special functions involved. It's also in the literature, uh, but 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 it's more complicated. Now, if you really want to keep both at the same time, I believe it still can be solved, but then you really need to dig in the literature. It might be in the book of six of it, maybe not, I don't know, but, but it's uh, definitely solvable numerically. Actually, if it's already in the underdog, you start getting completely different pages, you start getting different pages. Uh, but, but that should be all in the literature. Okay. Do, do you know what I guess young things? Are they over there? Are they Oh, uh, so I don't actually do this stuff, uh, but it is super interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of want to, I recognize that equation from, you know, trying to solve, like, in our uh, classic mechanics course in college, I remember we first spoke about the equation for a pendulum, and then we linearized sine phi, because it's hard to do when you're in college, I guess. Um, but, okay. And maybe, maybe one more thing about this. So, in this description of uh, phi, these potential wells, does phi have some like quantum fluctuations? Can it tunnel through these things, or is that like yeah. a weird thing yeah. to have? No, no, that's a good thing for us. That's a classical description. Okay. But indeed, then you can eventually quantize it. Then that's actually why I needed this kinetic energy. Okay. Because without kinetic energy, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Yeah. If you quantize it, it's a little bit like like. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit different. 
difference between yeah, that, that's probably correct, but why do you want to ground it? I mean, usually you want to pass current. Yeah, pass current. But uh, the bit normally we call the crossing uh, bit difference is crossing here and bit difference. Yeah, well, usually what you do is main, main crossing. <laughs> usually just like that. And then like this, and then you do the contact. And another one here. Usually two, three times that. Okay. And here the whole thing is fake. That's 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 all the heading. Without without the plug, the whole thing would have the same face, mm -hmm. and the, the whole other thing would also have the same face. Mm -hmm. uh, but but with the plugs, uh, with the plugs, it's different. Oh, you mean it's like in here here will be different. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah exactly. Because because you need also when you when you go around, you get to, to pick up the face, which is proportionally different. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see. So in essence, it's actually when you choose this crossing constant thing, you uh, mention that this actually is a bit different uh, in this uh, two conductor, this two quarter crossing, right? When is the hand mm -hmm. yeah. So normally you include it uh, or maybe half of it, then can you control the speed or can control the speed? How do you make this? Right, right, right. right, there are only two things. Uh, I mean, one thing you can do is even get what, 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 that's why they do squeeze, because then you control uh, by flux. By, by flux. Uh, you can also, in principle, control by voltage. I mean, you can apply, for instance, uh, AC voltage, and then the, mm -hmm. the phase would be voltage. Uh, well, the you mean, with the voltage, it just makes them have the kind of difference. Yeah, you, you, cannot, you cannot put such a voltage that the phase would be constant. That's not possible, because voltage is phi dot. Mm -hmm. If phi dot, if phi is constant, phi dot is zero. But, but you, in principle, you can still give a pulse and then the face would have a pulse. Yeah. But normally, for example, I don't know if the uh, experiment <laughs> group, many separate uh, the junction, normally, how does this difference would be? I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I um, well, uh, I mean, then you do something with the junction. Uh -huh. For instance, you, you pass current and then you have all this story. Uh -huh. And then the face is determined by, by the current. Uh, or you apply voltage and then, then the face is whatever uh, uh -huh. of the voltage. Or you couple it to something which has happened in different definite phase and then you can control the phase. Okay, one last question about you means uh, when you uh, can you grab this uh, uh, non interface and using uh, by using this uh, rotating operation. Mm -hmm. Normally, this two days that want to job time dependent, uh, time dependent or that won't satisfy this non -linear. Yeah, you, can, you can solve with a non-linear equation, you can solve it with that. No, no. Uh, if we don't do this deformation, we cannot solve it. That's the problem. No, no. no. Uh, you, you can actually, you can ask, start asking, I mean, for instance, you can say, good, we have thrown away some terms, what is the role of that, those terms? And maybe you can take them into account as perturbation and see what they do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that, that's a reasonable question. Yeah. But, but you cannot do it exactly unless you do it in numerical form. Mm -hmm. But analytically, it's just not solvable. And then but the absolute solution, okay. But it will be the equivalent to perturbation theory. Or this is, uh, after you do this, you always drop some, I don't know, you drop some hydrogen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after, after you've done that, it's solved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but you can still say, okay, maybe you're not happy with the rotating term of uh -huh. Maybe you want to take those fast with the rotating terms into account. Uh -huh. It's probably not important in this process, but it's, it's for instance, if you have like optical mechanics, you can say also, also at some point do, or if you did, you can also at some point use the rotating term approximation, and then you throw away some terms, which could be in some situations important. Oh, so that's not as What do you mean by not the heat? The heat. Are we talking about interaction or are we talking about the very last part? I, I mentioned it in two, I mentioned quantum state transfer in two contexts. 
just in the very beginning, when I was talking about nonlinear interaction, and then in the very end, my last slide, when I was I, I had this character. Which which one I was talking about, or were you talking about both? Okay. Okay. Now efficiency. I mean, ideally, in theory, of course, you have hundred. Uh, I think your story is is hundred percent fidelity, no problem. With the nonlinear interaction, uh, I, I there are some estimates which I don't have all, all the top of my head, but but you have very high fidelity. But then, of course, once you go to the experiment, then you have all kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But but the last in the last two slides, I even I even didn't take that into account. I, I, this your story is without mechanical resonance couples, because already if you have a cavity with the additional nonlinearity of the cavity. And then you just let it evolve, you already create this test space. Uh, and then the idea is that if on top of that, which I didn't show, you add. Yeah, right. So if I need to regard it as a street as a nonlinear mm -hmm. and this nonlinear uh, appears because of the, this mechanical thing. No, 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 it appears no. Before, in the first instance because of time flight. Oh, because of the, oh, I see. Because of the nonlinear thing. You can also, of course, in additionally, you can also take take mechanical mm -hmm. In the first instance, it's because of that. But those are land on you know, maybe the equivalent of no, no, but but time fly also gives you a nonlinearity of the cavity itself. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then you also have not the coupling, but but, but the, the biggest effect is the, the coupling is very weak because it's a uh, result of some function. Mm -hmm. The linear coupling, but the cavity is can be same model in the beginning. But in this field, then we don't have necessarily to consider the this nonlinear effects in between the street and the field. Well, well, it's super big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, it's still tunable, so you could have some situations when you can tune linear interaction to zero, and then it would be only nonlinear, but it's still big. Well, I mean, yeah, okay. Linear is actually strong. That's just a number. But only linear, I, all numbers I have ever seen, that's all it is. But, but if it's weak and non linear, it still could be non Yes. Thank you. Are we talking about this radiation pressure, which is normally? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What the pressure is? Mm -hmm. that, 